Welcome, everyone, to Positively Trek. We're glad to have you here. This is a special episode because we're going to talk about two new episodes of Star Trek in one podcast episode. I'm Bruce Gibson, and with me, as he always is, Dan Gunther. Dan, are you ready to talk about Star Trek? I'm so excited, so ready to talk about Star Trek. Uh, this is, you know, the first time in 22 years we've had two Star Trek episodes occurring in the same week. So that's pretty big. Like, that's been a long time coming. Yeah, so the last time was an overlap between, what, Voyager and Deep Space Nine, right? Yeah, the Dogs of War in Deep Space Nine's Season 7 and Voyager's Equinox Part 1. So, yeah, pretty historic. Yeah, and I don't think uh, we you weren't podcasting at that time. I know I wasn't. <laughs> Definitely not. No, uh, I we had we had dial up internet by then. I think, but yeah, no, no podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that great dial up internet! <laughs> mm-hmm, <laughs> I do mm-hmm. not miss those days at all. No, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, so we're going to talk about uh, the latest episode of Discovery, which is the season premiere for season four. And we're going to talk about the latest episode of Prodigy, which is taking a brief hiatus until January to pick up then uh, episode six when we get to January. So we're kind of seeing an ending in a sense just for a little while and the beginning of something. So I decided I'm just curious and I think I already know the answer to this, but I got up Thursday morning and I was going to watch Prodigy and Discovery and decided what order I was going to do it in is start with Prodigy first since it's going to take a little break for a while and then hit Discovery because then the next thing I would watch would be Discovery Season 4, Episode 2 next week. Yeah, I I woke up on Thursday and and my wife and I both watched Prodigy. Now, Discovery doesn't come out here until Friday, so I actually just watched that uh, the next day, of course, taking very uh, careful measures to avoid internet spoilers, which was difficult because with our discussion group, the Positively Trek discussion group on Facebook, go sign up, we'll let you in. I set up the spoiler threads for the various episodes, which I I think I forgot to do last week, but I remembered this week. So I'm getting notifications that people are commenting on the Discovery spoiler thread, and I just, I had to do my best to avoid it because, uh, yeah, I couldn't see it until a day later, which, of course, I realize I'm actually very privileged to be able to see it a day later, as opposed to a lot of other people around the world, as we recently found out. Yeah, let's go ahead and talk about that before we get into the two episodes as kind of our new segment uh, to the show. So we're going to talk about that and also just briefly talk about a behind the scenes look at the restoration of Star Trek, the motion picture. So let's talk about Discovery leaving Netflix globally and going to Paramount Plus. So, yeah, I, I think it was Tuesday evening. I looked at my phone and saw the Internet explode. And so I was like, what is going on here? And then I saw how all around the world, except for the United States and Canada, Discovery will not premiere this week and or this past week because it's leaving Netflix and going to appear in early 2022 on Paramount Plus. And in some countries, Paramount Plus is available. Others, it's coming soon. And I thought this is devastating news and it doesn't affect me personally. But for those who are just like me that are going every day, oh, it's just four more days. Oh, it's just three more days. It's just whatever. And then to be having that rug pulled out from under you <laughs> really sucks. And I was like, oh my gosh. And then it's like, we're going to talk about on the show. And to your point, there's spoilers out there. And so people have to duck and hide to not be spoiled on the interwebs. Yeah, it, it's really, the timing of it all is is really tragic. And, you know, everyone was anticipating Discovery coming. Everyone was waiting and exciting and counting down, like you said. Two days before it was set to premiere, Everyone gets this news worldwide and it's tough. I mean, it was kind of an expected development at some point that everything would migrate over to Paramount Plus. That's kind of the long-term goals of the CBS Viacom Corporation. But the fact that it's pulled from Netflix at a time, like, like I said, right before it's supposed to premiere... And during a period where a lot of people don't even have access to the service it's going to be on yet, 
really puts them in this kind of limbo for a few months, which is really frustrating. It's it's the growing pains of the Paramount Plus network. And I, I really, the timing is very unfortunate because the, just the fact that it, it's not so much that people will have to pay for another streaming service because people in the States are already in that boat. People in Canada have to get Crave to be able to see it if they didn't have that already. It's not that aspect. It's the fact that there's no avenue to watch the show, legally speaking, outside of North America right now. You know, just the fact that you're left with no options, basically. And that that's the frustrating part. So I, my heart goes out to everyone out there who is really looking forward to the Discovery premiere. And I mean, that even goes to the, the, the actors and the people working on the show. They apparently had no idea that this was coming. I mean, DST happened just a couple of weeks ago and there were stars from Discovery there to promote it coming soon. And like you said, the rug being pulled out from under them, just a perfect metaphor, because I, I think this shocked most people, uh, including, like I say, the stars and that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, there may have been people that were having parties planned to come over and mm-hmm. watch the season premiere. I mean, it was expected that was going to happen. And so you got caught up now in this business to business negotiations, working things out, buying out each other, you know, all this stuff. And that's the problem. It's business. But here's the positive to this, because, you know, there's positively Trek. That is the name of the podcast. The positive of this is this will avoid this type of situation going forward, because now Paramount Plus is the home of Star Trek because Viacom CBS owns Paramount Plus and the property. So they have control now of when future seasons and future series premiere so now you don't have this oh negotiations between viacom cbs and netflix or with amazon or whoever else it's on their own turf so at that point going forward you should be seeing the episodes at the same time as everyone else at least you would expect that's going to happen because they have full control over it i know some series like picard and lower decks are still on amazon But eventually, and this could happen again when they try to bring them over to Paramount Plus from Amazon. But once things are there, they're there and they're going to premiere them probably globally all at the same time because it's on their own turf. So that's the good outcome of it eventually in the long run. It just sucks in the short term. Yeah, for sure. And and there might be more bumps, more growing pains, as you say, as things migrate from Amazon, the the two series that are still on Amazon. And, And my me living here in Canada, uh, I'm definitely not immune. Like I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop with regards to their deal with Bell Media, and when, and I say when, will these series move from the Crave streaming service over to the Paramount Plus service in Canada, and will there be a, a similar kind of uh, mistake or, or bad timing, however you want to put it, with regards to a premiere date and that sort of thing? I'm. I, I basically am looking at the rest of the world right now and being in Canada thinking there but for the grace of God go I because yeah we here in Canada are definitely used to kind of sometimes being an afterthought with these things and it's it's pretty lucky that we're on a separate deal with CBS Viacom with regards to these series we could very easily have been in the same boat so yeah I like I say, my heart goes out to all of our international listeners and and please believe that I am absolutely empathetic with what you're going through. And and I know I just know something like this very easily could happen here as well. So, yeah, we even planned these episodes of our podcast to cover Discovery first in the episode and then Prodigy second, because we're thinking everybody's going to see Prodigy worldwide But then Discovery, you mean, yeah. I mean, yeah, Discovery Worldwide, but then Prodigy is not going to be available right now in some areas. And so, yeah, okay, it's just what it is. I mean, I heard somebody online mention, like, oh, here in the States, you know, we went through this with Doctor Who. You know, I remember a friend of mine going through VPN into the UK to use the BBC iPlayer to watch new Doctor Who years ago because it was coming later to the States. And my mm-hmm. daughter is big into Miraculous Ladybug and Cat Noir. And she's had that issue where it premieres 
in some country. It's it's developed in France, but it doesn't always premiere in France. Sometimes it premieres in another country, and spoilers are out there, and she's waiting to know when are we going to see it here, you know? So it's just the problem of international distribution. But like I said, once Paramount Plus, you should be safe in you know going forward and to your point dan yeah i'm i don't know when the day happens with bell media <laughs> i don't know what it's gonna be <laughs> like even for this show <laughs> it's like a sort of damocles hanging over you know i i don't have any access to what the negotiations are or what the contract says or anything like that so who knows and i mean you know th- this feels like back in the 90s and earlier right when you know star trek would show up on television broadcast in the u.s and then it would be sometimes years later that it would show up on overseas markets so uh it's i don't know weirdly nostalgic but it it sucks in this day and age we're supposed to have things i think a little more coordinated and you know we're still beholden to the lawyers and the contracts and all of that stuff so Ah, it's it's like it's like a peek to see how the sausage is made and and it's affecting the it's affecting the public and it's stuff we don't usually see. Usually things just run smoothly and that's for all of them to figure out. But this time around, yeah, there was a big bump in the road and and people are people are annoyed. <laughs> yeah, and I and I feel so bad about it even from a professional side because in my job, I do network deals. I don't do content deals. But I do deals of getting distributed, uh, of distributing networks onto different platforms. And even internally at our own company, I'll get a deal done and they say, oh, so we're launching tomorrow. It's like, no, there's like you said, there's legal aspects that still have to occur even when the agreement's done. There's technical aspects. There's all kinds of these other things, you know, just putting something on the platform takes developers to do something, you know, and they've got other things that they're doing. And so it just goes on the schedule and it just, you know, it just doesn't always happen overnight. So it's unfortunate. And, uh, but you know, we're still going to review here on the show. And for those who've avoided this episode until later, welcome to positively Trek all these months later. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. (laughs) So, but before we get to the episodes, again, I mentioned about Star Trek, the motion picture and Star Trek.com posted some images behind the scenes on the restoration of the motion picture, which will appear on Paramount Plus at some point next year. And I mean, to me, there's not a whole lot to say to this. It's just so nice to see these images of people working on it. And it just gets me even more excited. Yeah, definitely. And we'll have a link to this in the show notes. Of course, you can check out these images for yourself. I want this big screen set up like this looks pretty cool. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good point. Yeah, I would love a nice big screen. Well, I guess I do have one, but this is a, not, a lot nicer than mine. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> and I mean, just like all the editing equipment. That's how we need to do our podcast, stand. A big room like that with all this editing equipment and a big screen. Yeah. The, the crew all sitting around doing the various editing at various workstations in front of the screen. Does it not look like a bridge of a starship and everybody's got their station? Like that's how I want to edit these podcasts. That would be so much fun. <laughs> Just imagine as we're seeing each other on zoom that I'm on a huge screen looking at you. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Actually, I know someone that I used to work with years ago, and I hadn't seen her in almost a decade. And I went to the, her new office and walked in, and she had, I don't know what the size of this thing was, like a 54-inch TV sitting on her desk. its I mean, that's a large TV to begin with, but when it's on your desk, it's huge. And I'm like, what is she doing with such a huge TV on her desk? And she it was a, it's a TV that she bought like at Walmart. But she wanted to use it as her computer monitor. <laughs> wow. And it's huge sitting in front. Like she had to like, you know, look around it to see me <laughs> because she, you can't see her behind it. And I was like, but I love the idea of having multiple windows open and they're still large enough to see everything. Ugh. Mm-hmm. The bigger the screens are, the better, in my opinion. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Wow. Um I, I don't know about using a television on my on my desk. That might be a little overwhelming, but that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. So let's go ahead and talk about Discovery, but we'll be back right after this brief message. 
This episode of Positively Trek is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Jim Stoffel, Joyce Marin, Carl Morris, Dave Garcia, Rick Young, and Paul D. Kinnear. Thank you all so much for your support. If you'd like to help out Positively Trek, please go to patreon.com slash positively trek. You can help out at any level and get early access to episodes, exclusive content. And at higher levels, you can get shout outs, associate producer credits, and and more. Thank you so much to all of you who have already pledged your support. And to everyone else, thank you so much for listening. And with that, let's get back to the show. Ensign Tall, are you ready? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, locked and loaded. <laughs> you know, signed, sealed, delivered. Ready to stop talking now. <laughs> Good luck, both of you. Season 4, Episode 1, Discovery premiered. Kobayashi Maru. And, uh, yeah, I was very excited to turn this on and watch it. I waited till everyone left the house that morning. I closed all the curtains, made the room as dark as I could, pumped up the volume and watched this premiere. So Dan, what was it like for you when you first started watching it? Well, I was pretty excited. It was, uh, we're recording this on Saturday morning. So it was fairly late last night. I worked late, uh, till 10 last night and got home finally was able to watch it. I wasn't able to watch it earlier in the day. My wife was unavailable and I wanted to make that special and watch it with her because we're both big fans of Star Trek and Discovery in particular. So yeah, it was nice to finally be able to uh, sit down and, and watch it. And we got comfy on the couch and just enjoyed this new adventure uh, watching season four of Star Trek Discovery. And yeah, it was it was just fun. It was like visiting old friends again, if that makes sense, because they've been gone a little while. So it was nice to kind of hang out with them for a bit for an hour here. I like how you said it's been a little while because it has been. But at the same time, as soon as it started, it just felt like yesterday, you know, in a mm. sense, like you said, like seeing old friends, like you're just falling into something comfortable and something that you're used to. And it's just like riding a bike, you know, it's just like, okay, here we are on the next episode and let's see what's going on. And what we see what's going on is we see Burnham and book visiting a planet that hasn't been in contact with the Federation since the burn. And the relationship there between this planet and the Federation wasn't necessarily on the best of terms. And they're trying to reconnect with them and do a peace offering and, you know, with no strings attached by offering them free dilithium. And, well, miscommunication starts to occur. <laughs> and, uh, of course, especially when they mentioned uh, the queen and how they have this monarch that's on their ship and that they're keeping, you know, that is unhappy with how it's being treated. What did you think of this scene, Dan, this opening scene to the episode? I got to say, this was just such a delightful re-entry into the discovery world like one thing that i really noticed was the timing between burnham and book like these two actors are just like they're playing off each other they're snappy dialogue i was really enjoying that and then when you know like you say things kind of go bad and there's miscommunication and they start getting chased by these people and we, the action moves between them and Discovery, and we see the communication between them. My thought was, this show seems to have really found its voice. Like, the, it was just so well done and, and well paced and well edited. You know, Tilly on the bridge, is this a chase? Are you in a chase? And the yelling back and forth between them. Like, it was just, it was really, it felt like these actors were all very comfortable in their roles. And... I would say, you know, and, and there's arguments to be made that this happened earlier, and I think it did. But also, I, I think at this point, no one can deny that this group of people have really found their voice as a Star Trek series. And they just they just seem so comfortable in these roles and so natural. That's what I took from mostly from this opening sequence. Yeah, I, I did too. And that's something that I've noticed like in past Star Trek series and other TV series where the cast becomes more comfortable. They're more comfortable in the roles. They're more comfortable with each other. And you start to see them loosen up a little more. And they've kind of like, they put the clothes on in the first season and it fits well, but they're still adjusting to it. And then it's just like, now it's just like an, you know, an old 
coat and an old pair of pants that always fit so comfortably and, and they can just express themselves better. And I, I got a lot of bad robot film vibes from this. Uh, mm, I can see that. Yep. Yeah. I was getting a lot of vibes of that, which at some oh, point. Why is there always a cliff? <laughs> right. <laughs> which is funny too, because we'll get to it later, but there's a cliff in Prodigy on that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so, yep. <laughs> and yeah, there's a lot of cliffs going on. So I, I appreciated that. At the same time, I thought the, the scene was maybe a little over the top, you know, because I, I have to tell you, it drives me crazy even in Star Wars. But when a bunch of people are shooting at you and you can just run and run and their aim is so off. And we got a bit of an explanation here because their navigation because of the, you know, the gravimetric poles of the planet or whatever. <laughs> and um, I mean, the magnetic poles and the satellite arrays around the planet are off and they, they can't navigate through as well until they get the satellites up and going again. So maybe that's why they were bad shots. But even after the satellites got up, they're still bad shots. <laughs> you know, and that just drives me crazy. Even in the first episode of prodigy there, or maybe it was the second one, whatever, but they, you know, as the, our crew was trying to get on the ship, people were shooting at them and just missing. And I'm like, why does everybody miss? <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, is everybody stormtroopers? Yeah, see, that didn't bug me in this episode because, like you said, they actually call it out and give an actual reason. What did bug me, though, is when they get to the end of the chase and they're hiding behind this thing. And I'm like, these guys fly. Like, why aren't they just coming around? Right. Why Just just keep going and shoot at them from the other side. Yeah, that, that, that was the part that I was like, wait. Yeah. <laughs> it was a little weird. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, to me, it was a little over the top, but it was fun. It was a great way to just kind of have a little fun to kick off the season and, and get into the story. So I did enjoy it. So at, but at this point, too, as we're early into the episode, I think I in my opinion, I felt the show did a good job of establishing where things are at this point with our crew, with the Federation, that some time has gone by. The crew has established their place within this new federation and they're going and helping these other planets rejoin uh, communication or rejoin the federation after the burn. And I, I thought it works well. I didn't feel like they missed anything. I felt like it was really well established. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this world is really it, it feels fuller than in season three and, and we're kind of finding out our place here. And it's kind of cool that in the context of this episode and the world they've created for season four, the discovery crew are kind of like the honored elders, if that makes sense, you know, they're like the old school Federation come to guide the, the, the Federation of today, today in quotes, the 32nd century Federation into what it was before. And Saru gets called an honored elder later. And I was thinking that that could extend definitely to the rest of the discovery crew with regards to the Federation as well. Yeah. I kept wondering how they were adapting to new technologies. I mean, they got the new technologies last season, but it is a different time and it's not even about the new technologies, but it's just a different time. It's like how people relate to each other and stuff. I'd like to see a little more of them kind of struggling and fitting in to a new time. It's been 900 years. So that's a huge difference. I'd like to see that to have a, have a little fun with that. Yeah. I'd love to see like, you know, Stamets talking to Adira and saying, well, back in my day, we did it this way. (laughs) Right. Just a little bit of out of touch with, with current technology. We saw a little bit when, when Tilly, talking about Adira says that they're more familiar with the technology because they grew up with it and that sort of thing. So I I saw like a little hint of that there, but yeah, like you said, I want to see more of that. If like, you know, them maybe being not completely comfortable with this technology and still kind of learning how it works and stuff. Yeah, Remember where we parked, you know, something like that. (laughs) And then we get to meet the president of the Federation, which was a big thing last year. We kept saying, like, when are we going to see the president of the Federation? Well, we get to see the president of the Federation. And now this season we see the president of the Federation, but she's introduced by Burnham as the new Federation president. And I was like, well, who was the old one? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, President Lara Rillac and part Cardassian, which is kind of cool. I love that, you know, like we had the Klingons coming in as allies in the next generation. Now we 
way in the future and Cardassians are now a part of the Federation in some way, shape or form. That's pretty neat. Uh, interesting character. I'm, I'm curious to see what you thought of this character. I'm curious but, to know what uh, you think too. <laughs> yeah, we'll get into it for sure. But yeah, she's introduced, you know, like you said, as the new Federation president and definitely has shades of politician here. There's definitely that aspect to her character. Well, and that's what Burnham's thinking too, right? Because when the president says she's going to join them on this mission, Burnham's like, uh, no, I mean, this is not a smart idea. And you're, you're only doing this for political reasons. And it's like, you know, this is not safe, not just for you, but for my crew. And she's like, no, I'm going anyway. Mm -hmm. And at this point, as she's joining them, I'm like, okay, is she almost like a bad moral? Not quite to that extent, but I'm not sure how I think about this president. But I will say, as time went on and she's questioning Burnham's command decisions, I was still not sure if I really like this new president. What is she up to? But as it played out, I started to realize that... She is there for the good of Burnham and the crew, and she may not be wrong in her opinions. And so I started to like mm -hmm. her more. So I'm not curious to know what you think. Kind of the same as you, where, you know, at first I'm very wary of her. Like, she's giving her speech, and she's doing this thing that, that like a lot of politicians do when they're giving speeches, like the very exaggerated arm movements and the, you know, very political i'm talking about your crew and she makes the gesture and you know all this stuff and the points like this though you can't see me listeners but you know pointing up and doing this motion thing with her hand and stuff and and i was like oh it's just screaming politician and you know kind of annoying and that sort of thing but what's interesting is as the episode goes on i think both she and burnham are guilty of the same thing. I think both of them are underestimating the other. Yes, if that, that makes sense. Makes total sense, yes. And I think a lot of what the president says when we get to the end of the episode and she's talking about Burnham and she's being very frank with her, I think a lot of that is some good opinions. But at the same time, I also think she's underestimating Burnham a bit. Burnham at the start of the episode is very much underestimating the president as well, you know, saying that she's just a politician she's coming on the on the ship to check a box she says and even little things and and i love this when they use the spore drive and jump and she says to the president you may want to prepare yourself it's the t the first one's always difficult and the president's like mm, yeah no i'm fine and they jump and burnham looks back at her and the president is fine you know <laughs> i was a little disappointed I, I was hoping the president was like on the floor trying to get back up like <gasps> oh i was not disappointed that was that was perfect to me i i would have been disappointed if that's what they did like just to immediately undermine this character but i love that through that visual language they show us she is formidable and she's She's got a good presence. I loved that they chose they chose to do that. I thought that was No, perfect. I agree with you. I'm glad they did do that because at the time when I first watched it, I was hoping for that because I wanted the present to be put in her place at that time because I wasn't mm -hmm. really caring for her that much. And I didn't like how she was necessarily treating Burnham. But now that I've seen the whole episode and I appreciate this president even more and I like her, I'm glad they didn't do that, you know? So... It, I, I love how you said that they're underestimating each other because really that's what's going on in this whole series, even between all the different planets and societies and everybody's just trying to figure out their place and, and trying to figure out each other and how they all fit in. So they're going to be questioning, just like we saw the opening scene. You know, the, that race of beings is questioning the intent of the Federation and what are you really trying to do? So everybody's on their guard, right? And everybody's trying to lay out their path and try to determine what is the goals of the others. And so we may see this play out continuously like this throughout the whole season. So yeah, I really enjoyed the president and the dynamic between her and Burnham. And, you know, she's pointing out some things to Burnham that it's like, it does Burnham take too many chances. You know, I kept hearing Kirk saying risk is our business. And I thought, well, that's what Burnham mm -hmm. is. Right. But does she take it too far? And well, 
maybe she does because this is a TV show and you have to have a lot of fun and adventure in it, but it always proves out to be the right thing. Yeah. And there are a ton of parallels between Burnham and Kirk and, and people have pointed this out over many seasons, but it's very true. And I love that this episode kind of centers around the idea of the Kobayashi Maru because one of the big criticisms of Kirk in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, as Savick says, then you've never really faced the no-win scenario. You've never faced death at the end when he, when Spock is lost and, and they've paid this huge price. And it took that adventure for Kirk to realize that he does take too many risks and he hasn't really lost like this before. And I'm wondering, I, I, I don't know what the rest of this season holds, but I'm wondering if they're setting up a loss like that for Burnham. And if that's going to be like a reckoning for her where she realizes that, you know, maybe she hasn't, well, I mean, she has faced loss. Like, let's be fair. She's had a very tragic past, but as far as her captaincy and command in, in Starfleet goes, you know, maybe she hasn't faced that Kobayashi Maru scenario yet. Like she kind of dismisses it in this episode. She says, you know, the test's rigged. They don't tell you that, but you know, all this stuff. So I wonder, I, I feel like a real life Kobayashi Maru is coming. Dang it. I could be wrong about that, but that's what no, it feels like No, but I to feel me. like you're right now that you're saying it. First of all, I wanted to mention the test is rigged, she said, and I just wanted to say, does she know her brother's the one who created it? <laughs> <laughs> But at the same time, as you're talking through this, I'm thinking, book. You know, as you're talking about the dynamic between these two characters, oh, no. <laughs> what would be the big loss for her? And I feel like it would be book at this point. No, no, no. Don't say that. <laughs> la, 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 fingers in the air. <laughs> I mean, really, it could be anybody. You know, it would have a big effect on her. You know, Tilly or Saru or, her, you know, we we could go on. But yeah, that was the first thing that came to my mind, you know? Anyway, I, I don't mm. want to harp on that. Let's forget about that. Like you said, la, 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 la. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that's a good point because there's always some lesson that Burnham learns in every season. And the way this episode's starting off leads into that direction of some kind of loss that is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Or maybe she proves everybody right that she makes the impossible possible. I don't know. Could be. Oh, gosh. Ugh. Okay, I'm sweating now. Um, let's talk about Saru, because that, that's a little more tame for me right now. So, first of all, the first thing I notice as he's on Kaminar is that they have that little symbol, you know, on their chest that we kept questioning when we'd see images from season four. He's in his Starfleet uniform with this emblem on his on his chest. And we were like, you know, what is that? Is that, you know, does that mean he's an ambassador? Is that something from Kaminar? Like, what is that? And now we know that's just whatever the Kaminar symbol or whatever that, the, that these people who work on this council wear. So at least we know what that part is. Yeah. And it, the pictures that we see later of him in the uniform with that on make sense, given a lot of the scenes that we see in here where Sukal is talking to him and he says, you know, there's, you can have balance. You can, you can represent Kaminar and be with the Federation and Starfleet and stuff. So that, that symbol and the uniform together is just like, a a physical manifestation of that balance. I think that he's going to live in these two worlds that, you know, as we learn in this episode, don't have to be two separate worlds. They're all one big community. So that's interesting. I'm, I'm curious to see what he'll, his role will be when he comes back. And uh, yeah, it, it's going to be a fun season for Saru. I think, I think he's learning a lot about himself and finding his place. Yeah. I, I think I like how this is being handled so far that, he'll have like a dual role in Starfleet and on Kaminar. So uh, without being an ambassador or some other title, it's just he can have his hoofs in two different places. <laughs> 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 and uh, I'm, I am curious to see how that all plays out. But I, I enjoyed those scenes uh, with Saru and Sakal. 
and uh and Sakal's grown you know he's got his confidence he's got his friends he's established himself on Kaminar and so um I feel good about him I hope we see him again too I hope so too Bill Irwin is so much fun in that role and like his delivery of all of those lines he's just so good I loved when he called Saru the father he never knew and ah oh, that's just tugging at my heartstrings even though Sukal is is so much older, I think, than <laughs> well, that's Saru, true. for example. Well, I don't know. Saru but, was born first. <laughs> it's true, yeah. Tiny but wimey. <laughs> physically, but physically, he's so much older than Saru. I still love that relationship there where he says, you know, you're the father I, I never knew. Mm -hmm. That's so I sweet. I thought that too. I thought, well, physically, he's probably older, but yeah, mentally, he's still a child, right? So, but he also calls him his friend. So he's a father and a friend. So I ended I enjoy that so i'm looking forward to seeing saru hopefully next episode maybe on the bridge of discovery we'll we'll find out i mean we know eventually he will i just don't know if it's in the next episode i haven't seen any previews of the next episode so if anything's out there at the time of this recording i haven't seen it yet so i haven't even been mm. watching the ready room i keep forgetting that's on yeah i haven't been watching it either no i need to get back to watching that because you know i miss hearing will wheaton say hey nerds at the beginning, you know how much I love that. Uh, so, <laughs> so, okay, let's talk about Book's Planet, Quajon. He goes there because there's this coming of age ceremony uh, with his nephew, and he's there with his brother. And, you know, I, I don't know what it is, why I'm thinking that, but as that ceremony's going on, I kept thinking about the child actor. I kept thinking, like, how did they explain to this kid what, what's going on? Does he even really get it? Yeah, I don't know why I kept thinking that through the whole scene. <laughs> He's pretty adorable. I, 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 this, this kid is great, and he does a great job in the scene, I think. You know, echoing, echoing the words and that sort of thing. Yeah, I thought he was really good in this episode. I remember him last season, and I'm glad to see that both him and Kaheem are back uh, briefly. <sighs> we'll get to, I guess, yeah. but you know, it was nice to see them for yeah, sure. And I got a little queasy when, you know, a knife comes out. I'm like, Oh gosh, they're going to like cut their finger and do all that. And the blood and the, <laughs> you know. but anyway, you didn't see much of it, but I, I get queasy at stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But then they see the birds acting strangely and flying around. And we see one of Quazon's moons, uh, or books, he's like being destroyed. And, and it's like, okay, what's going on? And, I mean, I guess this is hints to what we're going to see throughout the rest of the season, at least in, you know, for the next few episodes, at the very least. But I don't know. What did you think? Because, you know, as I rewatched the episode, I started thinking about the birds versus what we saw of the people on the planet at the beginning of the episode, where uh, there's a discussion after that about birds i can't remember but birds use the um the magnetic poles to kind of determine like how they fly just like these people and so there's a relation mm. between that you know that things are off the gravimetric pool of things is off and so that's why the birds are flying weird yeah they're reacting to the the gravimetric distortions right. yeah. yeah so what did you think of all that did you have any idea what was happening at that time well, yes, just from the, the trailers and previews and stuff. <laughs> right. But but as far as the episode goes, you know, you're right there with the characters. It's a mystery what's going on. Let's investigate this. We don't know. But uh, yeah, I, I guess just from what we'd seen in previews and stuff, I kind of knew it was a gravitational anomaly of some sort. Yeah, yeah, which is sad that sometimes we get previews because it kind of hints. We, we know the little hints of, of things to come. But I didn't expect to see the disintegration of the planet at the very end yeah. of the episode. And I was starting to feel just as emotional as our characters. And I, I just, I felt it for book. What a gut punch. I was, uh, I was actually kind of just in disbelief as, you know, the characters are in disbelief as to what's happening in front of them. And I'm kind of in disbelief as to like, I can't believe they wrote that this happened. Like, what? Like they killed all of books, people, this, the planet is gone basically. 
completely, you know, there's nothing that can survive on the surface of that. And so his brother and nephew are gone, I'm assuming. I guess, yeah. Oh my God, that was brutal. Like that was a gut punch at the end of this episode. And um, yeah, that hurt to watch, to see Book's heart breaking and the disbelief on the faces of the crew as they, they're witnessing this. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm like really eager to see next week's episode to be like, you know, what are they going to do? What's going on? Oh my God. And, and just like, ah, I can't believe they just wrote off books planet like that. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's, I guess there really isn't a whole lot to talk about because it's at the very end and we don't know details to your point. Is his brother okay? Is his nephew okay? Are they all dead? I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, of course, that's going to be the focus of the next episode. So, yeah, I was I was a bit surprised. And I thought, well, now I know why we had that whole coming of age scene. So we have, you know, reintroduce ourselves to those characters, reintroduce ourselves to the planet, be sympathetic to the whole situation once this happens. So, you know, mm. yeah, it's it's sad. And uh, we'll see how it plays out. It so. was really sad because seeing... Quay John earlier in the episode, I remember thinking at the time, like, oh, that'd be cool if we see more of that planet and these people throughout the season. And if that's kind of like a bit of a home base for book and we see him interacting there more. Yeah, I guess not. But hmm. <laughs> see, it's your fault, Dan, because you were hoping for something and CBS heard you hoping you wanted that. And they're like, no, we can't let him have that. We have to uh -huh. throw him off. <laughs> so. I apologize to everyone. <laughs> It's like somebody says, you're like, don't say that because now it won't happen, you know? <laughs> <It's like that. laughs> so, yeah, I thought it was a really good episode. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I do want to give some special call outs to things. You know, our friend Brandy saw the episode before we did and said she had a very big crying moment, but she always has crying moments. But I thought there's got to be something extra crying in here. And as soon as it occurred, I was like, this has got to be that moment. Mm -hmm. And that's when mm -hmm. they talk about the Archer, what was it? The Archer Station or something? Space or Dock. Space Dock. The Archer Space Dock. And then that Archer's theme starts to play. That and was, was like, oh. incredible. <laughs> 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 that was really cool. Uh, that was, that was, and yeah, so the president is introducing the new Archer space dock to the, the Starfleet cadets and it lights up and the Voyager is sitting in the space dock. And yeah, like you say, we hear Archer's theme play over it. Ah, that was so nice to see enterprise get some love there. I loved that. Yeah. I can't wait till the soundtrack comes out to that. That will be fun to have. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. That was a moment. I also enjoyed seeing the various uniforms. I mean, we mm -hmm. saw the cadets in Starfleet Academy. We saw various uniforms that Burnham's wearing. I, and it was just, I don't know, it was just, it wasn't like everybody's wearing the same Starfleet uniform thing, you know? I like the various uniform types. Yeah, I, I love the uniforms we're seeing this season. Again, everyone looks really comfortable. They're, you know, it, it's it's just, and I loved, I and I made this comment, I love seeing the shots of the bridge and everybody's in bright primary colors, you know, like we haven't really seen that since, you know, Deep Space Nine had the shoulders, but I'm really thinking of like TNG yeah. with the, with the main uniforms and even the original series with, with those uniforms, I guess, you know, we saw Pike's crew like that as well, but you know, as far as the main featured crew of a, of a show, you know, it's just so good to see them all, you know, the bright yellow, the bright red and the blue. And it's just so gorgeous seeing Adira in a uniform and that they're an ensign. That was pretty cool. That was neat to see. The one person I thought looked kind of uncomfortable in his uniform though. And I don't know why, if it's just like his personality or how he moves or something. Stamets, when he's running around like engineering, doing like damage reports and stuff, he just looks like he's just like scrunched up his shoulders and he's like, I don't know. It looks like he's got too much starch in his collar or something. He's just, <laughs> he seems uncomfortable. I don't know why, but he just was like, I don't know. Oh, I don't, uh, just moving around weird. 
But now you know. I want to go back and watch that scene. <laughs> I don't know like, why. Just that. there were two separate scenes of him kind of doing that. And I was like, why does he look so uncomfortable? Uh, I don't know. It was probably just because he's avoiding explosions and sparks going off and stuff. But he just looked like he was like, ah, I don't know. All scrunched up. <laughs> I like how when Adira and Tilly beam over to that space station, he asks, is Adira all right? Oh, and Tilly and everybody else? I like that because it just shows that he's taken Adira under his wings. There's so, yeah, there's great moments like that. And earlier in the episode where Adira is talking about birds and the magnetite in their, in their right. skulls and stuff, the like fatherly proud smile that he gives as Adira walks off. I love that. That was just so sweet. I love yeah. Stamets and, and Adira. Their relationship's terrific. Yeah, and I like seeing Adira and Tilly working together on the space station and dealing with that Commander Nollis, and he's just like, no, we're going to do it this way. And it's like, okay, you know, I think he outranks you guys, but I like Tilly, you know, standing up to him, and it's like, no, we've got to do this, and we got to do that, or whatever. And, you know, I will say, too, that the whole Burnham getting in the the worker bee thing or whatever, she's got to do it. And, and, and the president's like, you're the captain. You shouldn't be doing it. She's I'm the best person to do this. I thought, okay, I can hear all these people who complain. Oh, there's Burnham saving the world again. I'm like, but you would see Kirk doing the same thing. You would see Cisco. You'd see mm -hmm. Jane. Like they do that. The captains are always risking themselves when they have a whole crew of people that could be doing for it. That's just Star Trek people, you know? Yep. Absolutely. That actually felt like one of the most Star Trek moments for me was. Yeah. The captain going out and doing it. Yeah, for sure. Commander Nollis, I want to talk a little bit about too. The actor that played him, he was a, uh, a recurring character. He played a recurring character on Kim's Convenience, a show here in Canada that I just absolutely loved. Uh, and, and Enrique, I believe, in that, in that show. I love this actor. And just to see him in Star Trek was so thrilling. And I'm just putting this out there into the universe. I know J. Michael Straczynski is doing a reboot of Babylon 5. There was a character in the original Babylon 5 named Veer. And if that character is going to be in the reboot, this guy needs to play him. And those of you who know Babylon 5 and have seen this episode of Discovery will know exactly what I'm talking about. Nice. Okay. I still need to watch Babylon 5. It's on my <laughs> watch list on HBO Max, but I've only watched the first 10 minutes of the first episode. <laughs> oh, God. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to check out just a little bit of it, and I, but I'll at some point get to it and just really watch it. But yeah. it sounds like I need to get through like so, <laughs> if you're a little saying, bit sorry <laughs> okay. a little bit a little bit yeah okay. i'll give it its chance I'll, I'll do that so okay there's one thing that was on my mind mm -hmm. about this episode who is the first officer yeah i don't know and related to that the scene we were just talking about as well where burnham is going and, and going to pilot the worker bee herself and the president says, this is a good idea. And she says, no, I have to do it. And she walks off the bridge. And I was like, who has the con? You didn't give the con to anybody. You didn't say so-and-so you have the con. We see later it's Reese. Reese is in command. But like, ah, <laughs> you didn't leave anybody in command, Burnham. What's going on? So, yeah, I was hoping we'd maybe find out who the first officer was then. But I have no idea. Yeah. So I think it is Reese. Because of that scene that we did see him in command. We also saw him in command while she and Book were on the planet in the opening scene. Mm -hmm. And there was something else, and I, I don't remember when, but there was like a brief exchange between her and Reese that also made me think, well, that's something that she would probably do and turn to to a first officer. And so then I looked it up because I don't remember what everybody's ranks are and it's changed now, too, because everyone got promoted. But he is a lieutenant commander. Mm. So, you know, I know we talked about last season going into this season, who's going to be the first officer. And, you know, we played with the idea of maybe it's Tilly. And it to me, it doesn't lean towards Tilly, which makes sense, especially if Reese has a higher rank. So I yeah. think it's Reese. But they're not playing that up because they're saving that seat for Saru. Hmm. That, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, acting first officer kind of thing or something. Yeah. Right. Right. And he would still have the rank of captain. Mm hmm. 
but yeah, to your point, like an acting first officer on the ship, that's what I think is going to happen. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, in Star Trek's four, five, and six, Spock was a captain, but was first officer under Kirk exactly. of the Enterprise A. Very briefly at the end of Star Trek four, but you know, five and six, yeah. Yeah. So I think I think that's the route it's going to go. But we'll that see. makes sense. That would be an interesting dynamic to see. Yeah, I just want to see a scene where Burnham tells Reese, um, you're not first officer anymore, okay? All right, let's move forward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I it, it doesn't really, really bug me, but yeah, the fact that Burnham left the bridge without saying who is in command, like even in TNG when Picard left the bridge and Riker was there, like you could just naturally assume Riker's in command, but Picard would always, you have the bridge number one, you know? Yeah. I just, I was like, ah, who's in command? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they should have had her call out who was in command at that yeah. point. Yeah. Just but, those yeah. little tiny Star Trek bits that I've always liked. You know, one of the things that I remember in season one of Discovery that I specifically wanted more of when Lorca was in command was in the original series, you know, people would bring things for Kirk to sign just randomly about like, you know, fuel consumption reports for the ship and that sort of thing. And I just always loved that kind of busy work of a starship that goes on in the background. And I always wanted just that little piece brought forward. And then, yeah. And this one just, you know, the captain saying so-and-so you have the con or something, you know, that's just part of the star Trek language that I love. So, yeah. Yeah. Like when she got on the turbo lift and she turns and the doors are getting ready to close, she should have said it then Reese, yeah. you have the con Whoosh, doors close. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that would have been good. So overall final thoughts of this episode. Overall final thoughts, really strong entry into season four. I, I'm loving this show. It's just, it's nice to have it back. I really enjoy these characters. Seeing Burnham in command is just a treat. You know, she was destined to become the captain at some point. You know, that's kind of been the arc of her character. And to see that happening here and, and her fully in command Really great to see. And her rapport with book is just one of the special things from this episode that I really enjoyed. So yeah, really strong opening. I'm going to have to give it a whole bunch of really cool butterfly people who are flying straight and true now because the satellites are fixed. <laughs> okay. That's good. Uh, I'm going to have a similar type of rating. I think I'm thinking that I really did enjoy this episode. There wasn't really anything I didn't like except the first opening scene. I thought was, a, like I said, a little over the top, but it was fun scene to watch. It reminded me of the Kelvin timeline movies. I, to your point, like the crew, the cast getting along, feeling comfortable meeting the new president who I didn't care for all that much as I was getting to know her to the point that I really started to like her at the end. So I love that they kind of twisted my feelings about this character around like that and how she's challenging Burnham and yeah, the relationship between Burnham and book and seeing what Saru's doing. And then you have the big explosive ending. So I will give this four and a half times out of five that the birds actually flew in the right direction. Hmm. Nice. <laughs> so There you go. Well, that's it. We've covered the episode, but what we're not used to doing is saying, now let's move on to the next episode of Star Trek. And this one is Star Trek Prodigy, Season 1, Episode 5, Terror Firma. Ah, uh, that giant ship is locked onto us with the drag to be. We need out of here. Disable the Protostar containment. Stop. The Protostar isn't just the name of the ship. The engine is a protostar. Protostar? Whoa, 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 whoa. So we're carrying around a baby star inside the baby ship? Baby star? Which means our warp drive has one heck of a kick. Moving mountains is how I like to start things off because this planet still tends to be a problem with these roots and vines that are trying to suffocate and hold hostage our crew members here on the planet and we pick up from where the last episode left off and our crew is there with Gwen and they're like, you know, you put us in this situation and, and Dow seems to have all these issues with Gwen. You know, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. We, you know, 
it's because of you that we're in this situation and, and you tried to steal the ship and now the ship crashed. It's always your fault. But the rest of the crew is very forgiving. Oh, but, you know, she saved Murph, <laughs> you know, and I love how they have like such big hearts. And I feel like Dal does, too. He, he does come around with Gwen and I, I'm really liking this group of people. Yeah, this was fun. I I think this episode for me personally is a step up from last week, which I don't know, just I didn't enjoy quite as much. But this episode, I felt I really enjoyed it. And yeah, their their rapport on the planet is they're trying to make their way to the crashed protostar. The whole thing with Gwyn and her, you know, having a a compound fracture and, and not being able to move that well. And Dahl initially says, leave her behind. We're not going to let her slow us down. And Rock Talk offering to help. But Gwyn, of course, being very independent and kind of stubborn, you know, uses her little morphing metal thing as a brace and won't accept the help. And I, I don't know. There's just so much of the personality of each of these characters showing through. Uh, I'm really enjoying how they play off each other here. Yeah, me too. I, I love how the planet is terraforming and Rock Talk wants to call it Larry. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. We again, I, I do have to call this out a little bit. We get the pun joke, right? Where where they said, oh, the planet's terraforming around us. And Rock Talk says, it's trying to make us afraid. And they said, no, no, not terror forming, terra forming. Right. And It's a funny pun joke, but in like everyone's hearing their own language with the translators. So Rock Talk probably heard that as like a series of of growls and stuff. So does Terror and Terra sound close to each other in her language too? So it kind of the joke, if you dig into it deep, doesn't make a lot of sense. But it's, you know, it's a fun pun for what we hear. So that's okay. But yeah, we talked about that in a previous episode. They keep doing these puns, but yet they're yeah. all speaking different languages. So how does that work, right? Yeah, the initial, the one that we talked about could make sense if they were speaking standard, which we thought they might be. But in this case, like they're definitely not. So that's a little confusing, but that's okay. It's still a funny joke. Unless the translator is getting things wrong or the translator is playing a joke on them. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but I do like how Rock Talk, not Rock Talk, but uh, Jacob Pog calls it the murder planet. And so <laughs> they kind of stick with that one. Yeah. Rock Talk wants to call it Larry. I'm kind of with her on that one. You know, I like Larry, too. I think that's a good name. <laughs> I, I think we need a planet called Larry and maybe Mo and Curly. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Various planets like that. But Zero says it's a sentient life form, that it's not a planet. But they still continue calling it a planet as they go on. But then they go through all these adventures of, you know, Gwen is burning the roots with with her torch. And then the fire surrounds them. And there's another cliff, just like Book and Burnham (laughs) had, you know. And they're able to slide down it. And then there's the acid rain. What do you think about their adventures through all this? I thought it was fun. I mean, it it makes sense with you know, the obstacles that are getting thrown in their way. And, you know, it's a fun adventure for, uh, you know, a kid type show. So yeah, I I liked that it was kept interesting and and they had these interesting problems to have to overcome. Yeah. I thought that was fun. I do too. It's, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's a show that's supposed to appeal to kids. And so you want to give them these little adventures and trying to avoid things and duck and roll and all that. And I enjoyed it too. So it's a lot of fun to see them all doing that together. And uh, getting through it all. But one of my favorite parts is later in the episode where we see the hologram Janeway on the protostar. And she's by herself and those roots are trying to, you know, capture the ship and just take control of it. And, and, and she's like, what do I do? What do I do? And then she's like, what would the real Janeway do? And I'm like, yes, what would the real Janeway do? I want to see the real Janeway come out of her. And she makes the decision that, well, it needs a cleaning. So... <laughs> They got these ship scrubbers coming out that get rid of those roots. And I just love the idea of the hollow Janeway because it's not the real Janeway, but it's the computer trying to figure out what would real Janeway do. And so this this hologram will start to become probably more and more like the real Janeway. Yeah, that was fun to see her kind of 
by herself, right? Not just yeah. interacting with the kids, but like trying to figure things out herself and and seeing like where the the lengths of this program go to and that sort of thing. And and yeah, what would the real Janeway do? And I totally pictured the real Janeway in her command chair giving that order and then saying, looking intensely towards the camera and saying, time to clean house. Like just giving a Janeway one liner there. I was like, yeah, that's great. (laughs) That's perfect. (laughs) There are times I close my eyes because it's animation. There's times I close my eyes and I try to picture a real life looking Janeway, Kate Mulgrew and the voice, hearing the voice. And it just is like, it gives me Voyager chills. Like it's a new Voyager. You know? Yeah. Well, then we find our crew. They end up on a crash bird of prey. And I just have to say, what the heck is a bird of prey doing in the Delta Quadrant? Like, I'm just like, so like, I have to say, I'm just a little annoyed with so many Alpha Quadrant things being in the Delta Quadrant. But I keep telling myself, maybe this information will be revealed later. And I'm I'm playing with head cannon stuff, but at the same time, look, it's not the first time we've had Klingons in the Delta Quadrant. I get it, but mm-hmm. we're just tapping in the Alpha Quadrant a little too much for me. Yeah, I'm I'm feeling the same a little bit. You know, it's it's a little strange that there's so much Alpha Quadrant stuff in the Delta Quadrant, which is interesting. I said kind of the same thing about Voyager when I was watching it. You know, there's every you know every season they find something from the Alpha Quadrant. Which seemed a little like, you know, space is big. It's very, very, very big. It it seemed weird then. And yeah, it seems a little weird now. And like you, though, I'm hoping there's some sort of explanation that comes along. I don't know that there will be. I'm I'm getting less and less convinced every week that there's going to be like some sort of big explanation that will satisfy all of the questions. But it's possible. But it it does seem a little strange at this point. Yeah. I'm I'm with you. I was thinking the same thing. Like I I don't know if we're gonna get an explanation. We're just maybe supposed to accept that for some reason a bird of prey is there and whatever else is going on these other things. But I will say what I really liked about the bird of prey is Jankum Pog is on the bird of prey and it makes him miss being home. Hmm. And I thought, oh, he does remember the Alpha Quadrant. He recognizes the ship and it's the first time he really misses home. And he talks about, you know, this not being a sleeper ship. And we know he got into the Delta Quadrant on a sleeper ship, which makes me think even more that since he doesn't seem to be familiar with the Federation, he may have known Klingons in the Alpha Quadrant before the founding of the Federation. So he could be from 400 years earlier Mm -hmm. to this time until he was woken on the sleeper ship so it really caught my interest on, on when he delivered that line that's interesting yeah i'm i'm really looking forward to learning more jenkin pog's story especially is is interesting because yeah like how did he get there and all this stuff and uh, now he has a mechleth too so that's kind of cool that is yeah <laughs> which gwen recognizes she knows mm-hmm. what kind of weapon that is and i'm like why does gwen know that you know <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's from all of the stuff that her father has taught her, I think. Yeah. But, you know, why and where did he get all that information? I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always coming out of these episodes with little questions like that. You know, like, why is this? Why is that? You know, Ugh, I want to know. And now we got to wait till January to get to the next episode. <laughs> so at least Discovery is going to keep my mind off of it for a while. But I did like the scenes between Dal and and Gwen on the ship about, you know, just their dreams and, you know, the things that are missing in their lives that they want. And he doesn't know who his parents are. He doesn't know what they look like. Of course, her want is having a father that really loves her and really cares about her. And it was just a nice scene to see these two bonding more together and looking at the stars and I would say that the whole, all that whole scene, all, everything that takes place on the Bird of Prey was something I, I really enjoyed. It was a good moment for the, for all the characters. Yeah, it was. It's a moment to kind of stop and breathe and take a little bit of downtime. That was really appreciated for sure. And I, I, I like that. It can't be just action all the time. I love these little character moments for sure. Yeah, and they have a little campfire, and I'm glad they weren't 
passing around beans like Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. So they didn't go there. <laughs> but speaking of Gwen's father, he does arrive, and he's in a moment where he sees Gwen being attacked by those roots and vines, and also he sees the protostar in the same manner. And she's like, father, father, help me. And he has to make the decision. Does he go for his daughter or does he go for the ship? And of course the jerk that he is, he picks the ship over his daughter. And I was like, Oh, what a jerk. I, those, that's not the word I really want to use, but I'm (laughs) trying to keep it clean. And I mean, if anything speaks to her then about how her father thinks of her, it's that moment. And that's, that's the nail in the coffin. Yeah, definitely. That was a heartbreaking moment, even though you know where it's going, like, you know, what's going to happen, but it was still a little bit heart wrenching seeing, you know, she's there, she's getting swallowed up by this planet and he does hesitate. He looks back, looks at the ship, looks back, looks at the ship, which is almost worse because it wasn't. It wasn't an absolute heat of the moment, like he just wasn't thinking and and went for the ship. He considers it. He stops. He takes a moment. He weighs what is more important to him. Then he makes the decision and turns his back on Gwyn and goes for the ship. And, oh, how, like, just despicable. And, oh, man. So, you know, Gwyn up to this point has been a little blind to what her father is and how he acts, but she's not blind anymore. She has seen when the chips are down, what he will do to achieve his goals. And if it means sacrificing her, well, it means sacrificing her and she's not liable to forget that anytime soon. No. And when our crew does get back on the ship and is able to escape and leave the diviner behind. Well, before we get to that, though, I want to talk about, I think, my favorite moment in this episode, which is the the actual moment that got me that I was like, oh, the episode tricked me here and they did it really well. The ship that the diviner is going towards, right, when he chooses the ship and he goes towards it and he's going to go up the ramp to the ship. And then we go inside the ship and see someone coming up the ramp. And that turns out to be dull. And then we see the diviner. The ship was an illusion. The planet was showing that to him to lure him in. I was like, Oh man, this episode got me. Like I totally (laughs) didn't see that coming. That was amazing. Just a perfectly scripted and perfectly executed moment that just, was so well done. I just wanted to tip my hat to uh, the animators, the writers for that moment, because I was literally at my TV going like, Oh man, like I had no idea that was going to happen. Yeah. I was a little confused at first. I was like, wait, I thought he was near the ship, but he's not. Oh, it's an illusion. Right. And it was so good. When we see him approaching the ship, you know, the silhouette, it's really an outline of him. I rewatched it again. I mean, it's it's him, you know, and but it's actually then revealed as doll. And it's like I'm like, is Hollow Janeway thinking it's him? That's why we're, we're seeing that illusion. But regardless, it's really for the audience, right? It's to do yeah. what you just said. And yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out because that that was really a great moment. Which then of course leads me to what I was talking about the chase and you know, I think at this point, Gwen realizes the family she wanted and her father doesn't exist. And she has now found her new family. And that's the crew members of the ship. And when he's pleading to her, you know, oh, you know, I want the ship. Help me. And she's just like, this is the moment I love when she's just basically telling him to F off. <laughs> you know, <laughs> She doesn't need him. This is her ship and she's taking it away. I loved it. That was brilliant. Yeah, that whole scene was so well done, even though, again, you know what's going to happen. You know how it's going to play out, but it's still so satisfying to watch. And Gwyn is very much with the crew now, like she's with the rest of them, Doll and all of them. So uh, that was so much fun because they're the ones that went back for her. They rescued her. You know, she sees the true worth of, of these people versus her father. Yeah. They still owe her one (laughs) when they rescued her, you know? Absolutely. (laughs) But then they were able to escape his ship because 
because of this protostar containment field that's you know that's the energy of the ship that they discover which Janeway discovers earlier in the episode and now you know they're discovering this and I thought have we ever seen a ship with oh wait I have to call it out how how Rock Talk calls it a baby star Woo! <laughs> <laughs> the ship is powered by a baby star we've never seen that right I mean even what? in the future or did we it reminds me a lot of the Romulan ships, how they're powered by a singularity. So oh, yeah. it just, it just reminded me of that a little bit. Yeah. But we've never seen like a ship powered by a protostar. That's pretty cool. And I like that they call out, that's not just the name of the ship. That's, you know, no wonder it's an experimental ship NX. you know, this, this is pretty new technology and they, they have proto warp. So that's pretty cool. Right. Okay. So now the Trekkie in me starts thinking, this is cool, but then this is an experimental ship. Then maybe this doesn't work well because when we go into the future and discovery, I don't hear about any kind of proto star ships. I mean, maybe there are some that exist and they haven't talked about them, but it makes me wonder if this is the type of ship that works, then why wouldn't there be more later? And I'm just curious as to why it was stranded in the Delta quadrant that maybe there's some problem with this technology. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm wondering if they'll, like you say, end up being some sort of problem with it. Or maybe, you know, proto stars aren't just, you know, something you can manufacture easily. <laughs> right. There's, and there's that too. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm curious to see where it all goes. But it's kind of fun that, you know, we've got this series centered around this experimental technology discovery started with, you know, their ship centered around this experimental drive technology. It's it's kind of interesting that that's the kind of template for some of these new adventures. So, yeah, and I really enjoy that. I like seeing new ship technology like that that they're experimenting with. So that's mm -hmm. that's really cool. So, okay, overall thoughts about this episode of Prodigy? I really enjoyed this one. Like I said, I think it was a step up from last week. I loved the conclusion of this. I loved the emotional moments between Gwyn and her father, and Gwyn and the rest of the crew. And of course, Rock Talk steals the show with whatever part she's in. Zero kind of took a little bit of a backseat this episode. They were kind of not as prominent, but, you know, still some great moments with every character. And I'm really enjoying this show. It's so much fun. My biggest question coming out of this episode now is when Eagle Moss does the Proto Star model, will they do two? One with it just normal and one with like the Proto Warp? thing extended i don't know because i want both uh no i'm just <laughs> kidding that's that's not my biggest question with the episode but yeah i'm curious where where they're going to end up because like the diviner and and dreadnought say they're they're off the maps the ship is gone so where are they now how far are how far have they gone you know how fast is this thing i'm really curious to see them figure that all out it's fun that Hollow Janeway didn't know about the technology. I think that's interesting. That is an you interesting know, point, yeah. Because she only has access to the lower level systems. I love that there's obvious things that Gwyn knows about this ship that Janeway didn't. So the fact that both Gwyn and the Diviner know about the proto-star technology shows why he was interested in finding the ship in the first place who knows what he was going to use it for but that's the technology that he was after and uh yeah now Gwyn and and the rest of that crew has it so i don't know anyway i'm i'm giving this one a high rating i'm giving it five out of five proto stars that are off the maps now good um i want to go there but not quite a five out of five for me but close so for all the reasons that you said is why I like it too. And I like how this ended with the ship going somewhere. Where we don't know. I think that's a good way to t good place to take this break for a couple of months until it mm -hmm. returns. I, I like that as being like the, the hanging Chad in this. Oh, why did I say hanging Chad's? Oh, I hate that whole thing anyway, but the, <laughs> I don't know why I never say that. I don't know where that came from. But regardless, I'm going to give this one almost a full bucket of acid rain for the digestive system of the planet. Hey, planet's got to eat too, man. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Just like uh, 
Jenkum Pog has got to eat like all the time. <laughs> so, well, you know, this was fun. I enjoyed getting two episodes. And of course, we're not going to get two episodes again until January, but that's fine with me because I got a lot going on with the holidays. So <laughs> that that's pretty cool. And you know what? As we were wrapping this up, talking about Prodigy, and I was, we just talked about Discovery, I'm just thinking how much I love Star Trek and how much I just love the new stuff, too. Like, I'm having mm-hmm. so much fun with this stuff. That's the thing. You know, people sometimes take things a little too seriously when it comes down to it star trek is entertainment and darn it if i am not entertained by these shows i am having so much fun so i on that level it's an absolute win for me yeah it's not tng it's a different style i mean they're all different and that's what i like about it it's different takes different styles different characters different situations different rhythms it's cool you know it's like the music doesn't have to be played the same all the time, you know? And that's what I love about it. So, Dan, when people want to talk about the rhythm of Star Trek with you, where can they find you? You can absolutely find me on Twitter. I'm at Kurtrats, that's K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S, and on YouTube.com slash Kurtrats Productions, and of course, in the Positively Trek discussion group on Facebook. And I'm on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex. That's Admiral with the underline Rex. And occasionally on the Star Wars Report podcast and Literary Treks. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. And again, special thanks to our patrons on Patreon. We can't do it without you. There are costs involved to make this podcast happen. And you guys are helping us out in covering those costs. And we really appreciate that. And we appreciate to all our listeners who tune in each and every week. And listen to us just blab on about Star Trek. So we want to just tell you that whether you're getting the new episodes or not, we want you to stay positive.